Yeah, we can order. It's 10 more than Okay, you guys are going to get started. It's funny because it was kind of quiet in here, and then all of a sudden everyone started having a good conversation. I hate to like interrupt the good conversation. Um, okay, for something as exciting as radiology, biology, but um, we must do what we must do. So here's the objective. So that this PowerPoint is off of chapters two and three in the textbook, and a little bit of review and some new material too. So, um, so these are the objectives. So today we'll go through this PowerPoint, and then I'll pull up some forms that will help us um, think about how we prescribe radiographs and how often patients get what radiographs. And you kind of have to think about it in terms, those of you who have worked with a dentist, you're very accustomed to just taking the film that perhaps the dentist tells you to take. The same with most hygienists. We just sort of get accustomed to thinking, well, this is their six months. We do, you know, every other appointment we take bite wings. You know, this six months we perio chart, the next six months we take bite wings, then we perio chart, then we bite wing. And you get into this sort of a routine. Um, and similarly, as an assistant with the dentist, they tell you what they feel they need. And very, and it's supposed to be based off of what the patient really needs, and it's not dictated by insurance. But very often times, it can fall into a little bit of a insurance rut. So you have to think in terms of patient risk assessment and what they need based on their risk. Because you will get patients who want to push back on how often they get radiographs, and they may genuinely not need them as often as the doctor that you work for would like to have them take the x-ray. So it's helpful if you know the, the sort of the guidelines and then understand their risk assessment. And then you can, if you want to, advocate for the patient's need to either have them or not have them, you know, if you want to actually get into that conversation with your employer, um, or which you may or may not want to do, but, um, or you can at least also help explain to the patient why they need it more frequently then, well, I was told I only need them once every three years. Well, maybe they really do need them more than that. Um, and maybe they need them more frequently than what you would recommend for the average person. So I'm kind of getting off on a tangent. We'll talk about that at the end. And um, I have some um, forms that you can look at. I'll show you those at the end. Yeah. It's going to be on this PowerPoint. Yeah. Yeah. And I probably will not put... The, the other stuff like prescribing radiographs, I don't believe that that's on the quiz. Um, I think it's just the content on this PowerPoint. Well, yes. I require to the but you do need to know that material for a test. Yes. So prescribing radiographs and, and some of those basic understanding. There's a lot of information on the form, that it, the form that we'll look at. You don't have to memorize all of it. It's like a resource that you can utilize, but you do have to know sort of some basic things about prescribing x-rays. Um, okay, so moving along here. Can advance my film. Um, so why is it important to have a knowledge of radiation biology? Why do you think we need to know? To protect patients, to protect ourselves, yeah. Do no harm, yes, I love that. Before anything, do no harm, side effects, because all of, um, all radiation causes ionization and some kind of cellular damage. So it's really not true. Like if you say to your patient, X dental x-rays are totally safe. They're totally safe. And trust me, everybody said, I'm sure I've said it. I mean, I can't like remember a specific, but I'm sure it's come out of my mouth. And the truth is, is that it's relatively safe in comparison to many things that we do, but it's still doing some damage. And so like, you can't just tell your patient that they're like, safe, like harmless, nothing ha is happening, because that's not really true. But if you know 
how to like explain it in relation to how we live the rest of our lives and other risks that we take into account, then it's, then it's not such a big deal. Um, okay. All radiation is harmful and produces biological changes in living tissue and radiation biology um, defined is the study of the effects of ionizing radiation on living tissue. <coughs> Okay, so effects of radiation. So there's a couple things when the X-ray photon leaves the tube head and it comes over to the patient and it starts to interact with the matter or their cheek or their um, their skin or uh, teeth or whatever. There's a couple different things that happen on a cellular level or like an atom, you know, small level. We have excitation, we have ionization. And then there's one more on the next slide. So excitation, the first one, an X-ray photon interacts with the atom or an orbiting electron. This should All these kinds of terms should be familiar by now. We're thinking in terms of atoms and the electrons that orbit the nucleus, causing the electron to vibrate. So it just goes in and sort of makes things start to jump around a little bit. So it just vibrates, kind of shimmies. It does a little shimmy. Energy produced um, can be emanated, emanated by a light or heat, which is harmless, or that shimmying and vibration can actually start to break the molecular bonds and disrupt the molecule. So it could literally sort of calm down and not do anything at all, which would be the best case scenario, or it would actually end up breaking the bonds, <clears throat> which is more than li likely what would actually happen. I am recording. Thank you for checking. I always like that because sometimes I think I've pressed record and then I forget, but I see the red dot. Um, ionization is the second option of what can happen when the X-ray photon comes in contact with matter, the atoms. Ionization is the electron is ejected from its shell. So you have these uh, orbiting electrons. It's ejected from the shell and it creates an ion pair. So now you sort of have this unbalanced, um, ion and um, an atom. So the atom is no longer electrically neutral and it becomes chemically reactive in its attempt to make everything kind of copacetic again. It wants to replace that missing electron. So when you so now we have like sort of an unstable environment and we have an environment where our body is going to try to make up for this this interaction. So ionization occurs, excitation can occur. Or, well, I guess the next one would be breaking the bonds, but I thought there was a different one on this slide. So anyways, but these are the, these are the three, um, this is just a little schematic that sort of breaks it down. So it shows it again. We have the X-ray photon that comes from the machine. We're gonna get one of these three interactions. And I think that breaking the bond actually comes from excitation. So I guess those two were on the same, the, um, under the same heading. So we have ionization, excitation, either just a vibration and then it settles down or the molecular bonds actually break. Any way it happens, no matter which of those three, except for the harmless, if it vibrates and calms down, then it's not gonna happen. But any of those things that actually occur with a change, either ionization or breaking of the bonds is gonna result in a chemical change. If there's a chemical change, you're gonna get a biological change. It's just guaranteed. There's a chemical change, you get a biological change. Um, yes, yes. Yes, I think it's just sort of like you can think about it as, you know, some entity comes in and disrupts, you know, the normal happenings of the atom. So it sort of causes a little something to happen, but nothing actually becomes broken or destroyed or ionization doesn't actually take place unless that disruption is so much so that the vibration ends up breaking. So it can lead to that or it could just settle back down. And I don't know what percentage it happens one way or the other. You don't need to know or worry about that. Okay, so here's an example of, um, in this video, I won't play it, play it because sometimes these just don't even work. But if you can go in on your own um, 
this is just an example of um, excitation and sort of an artistic rendition. It's like a, somebody playing the guitar and the camera's like from inside the guitar. And so when um, they strum the strings on the guitar, you can, they've slowed it so that you can see the vibration. It's kind of a pretty, kind of pretty and soothing. Yeah. I mean, but for SAT, is that kind of like when the atoms or when the photon or the electron goes through the out? Probably similarly. We don't really talk about it in that kind of detail, but I would assume that something like that's happening. It's interacting with the cell, but it hasn't like knocked out any electrons. It hasn't been absorbed by an electron. So it, it might likely just be passing through. It doesn't actually, you don't get tested on that concept and it doesn't specify specifically, but I would assume that something along those lines is what's actually taking place. And then the TED talk um, is just, so this is nice to know. This, I should star this with nice to know, not have to know. So this slide, you don't have to study anything that's on this. It's just some added tidbits of interesting information. One is kind of visual and then the other one is just a, it's kind of a nice TED talk, but you don't have to know that um, for a test or a quiz. Effects of radiation on an atom. So this is kind of, I should move this slide up because it's sort of disjointed. So here we go into the breaking of the, um, into the breaking of the molecules. So uh, broken molecules won't work the same. We have a chemical change and then which leads to a biological change. So we're not gonna have the same functioning ability of the cell once a bond is broken. You're either gonna lose cell function or the cell just dies. So if you lose cell function or it dies, both of them are negative, right? So you, so something negative happens once those molecular bonds are broken. Um, the most important aspect to this is if it's something like this happens um, like with DNA or something like that where you're gonna get, um, and if you have enough of it, like you have enough radiation exposure and it's, affecting the DNA, that's when we really start to get into trouble. If it's something like, you know, a little bit of um, exposure to the cheek and then those cells turn over and repair, it's not such a big deal. But if we have like a large enough dose for a long enough time, that's when we start to really get concerned. So here's just another diagram that sort of shows a similar thing from before. We have the X-ray photon. It can either cause this excitation, which is this kind of cell vibration, or it can cause the ionization. Either way, either path will um, generally lead to the same outcome, um, unless, of course, like we said, the it just settles down. Um, but if the molecular bonds are broken or ionization is a direct pathway to chemical change and biological change. So same thing, saying the same thing, just a little different picture. Okay, so the effects of radiation on the atoms or on um, cell, different cells. So human cells, we remember this from biology, we're mostly made up of water, right? So if uh, an X-ray photon comes in and interacts with a cell, most of the time it's gonna be interacting with the, the water part of the cell because that's just 80%, there's most of that and there's a little bit of nucleus with DNA or all these like important components to the, D to the nucleus. But most of what um, the X-ray photon will interact with is gonna be water. So human cells contain 80% water, 20% of other kinds of molecules. For this class, we're just calling, we're lumping them all together and we're calling them the chemicals of life. You, we don't need to go into any more detail than that. You've all taken other courses and you've learned into much detail. And so all we have to know is that those are the chemicals of life. And when um, you get a direct hit into those that area, you know, obviously it can be more damaging. Um, and it, again, like I said before, it depends on dosage and length of time, um, but we still get a reaction even from the interaction between the photon and the water, which can still be negative. But 80% water, 20% chemicals of life, the higher likelihood that the X-ray photon is gonna interact with the water molecules over the chemicals of life, just because sheer volume, you know, number of each thing. 
So ionizing radiation with a molecule of water is called radiolysis. So this is the most common interaction that you're gonna get is radiolysis, most common. Ionized water molecules form free radicals. We've all sort of heard those terms, free radicals, um, and we know that they denote something negative. And so, you know, eat, eat more blueberries. It helps fight free radicals, you know, things like that. So we want to, we kind of know that we want to, um, limit the amount of free radicals in our bodies. Free radicals, they're molecules containing unpaired electrons and are extremely chemically reactive. So a free radical float, floating around in your system is extremely chemically reactive, very short-lived, has a very short lifespan. So it's desperately seeking Susan. <laughs> Do you guys know that movie? I can't believe that came out of my mouth. I don't even know where that came from. That's such an old movie. It's like from the 80s. But who knows that movie? Like, seriously, I see one hand. Everyone else is like, what is she referring to? Um, Desperately Seeking Susan. It was a movie. It's a movie from like the 80s. And there was, um, and I just was like desperately seeking a pair, but then Susan just came out of my head. So I don't know why, but it's, I don't even remember really what the movie, I think he's just looking, he's looking for Susan. Like he <laughs> saw her or something in somewhere. And I saw the actor in the airport one time. Like I was, we, my sister and I were going, I think to see my grandparents and we saw this big um, comedian. Oh, I can't remember his name now. And then we saw that actor and I can't remember either of their names. I'm getting old, but in the same airport, we saw both of those people way off subject, <laughs> but that's okay. We Sometimes our brains need to do that. So, um, so I hear, are there questions or are we just, I'm, I'm not missing anything? Okay, um, so free radicals, they're highly reactive. They're desperately seeking a friend. <laughs> they're desperately seeking something to um, interact with um, and they are short-lived. So they will, they'll, you know, something bad will happen. They'll, they'll burn up quickly. Um, if they don't find something. So they're really aggressively looking for another um, pair. So examples of free radicals are just hydrogen and hydroxyl. So the H plus or the OH minus, those are examples of free radicals. And so then they pair up to form um, other things which ends up end up being toxins, specifically toxins. So we'll, um, we'll talk about that a little bit more as we go here. So um, a free radical is an uncharged or neutral atom or molecule that exists with a single unpaired electron um, and in its outermost shell. And that's why it's so reactive is because it's looking to add its electron to something. Highly reactive, unstable. Um, and so here's a diagram. We have the x-rays come in, they interact with the matter. Um, they hit, they cause radiolysis, they hit the water in a cell, um, ionization occurs, which knocks out um, some electrons, and now we have free radicals. So now all these free radicals are forming, they desperately want to pair up with some other cell or some other atom, and then they can form things, toxins, such as hydrogen peroxide. Um, so this is probably one of the most common things. So then you have these toxins in your in your cells in your body that are not good for you, um, which will cause can cause damage. Yes, they'll the free radicals will look for something to combine. They'll form a new molecule. Typically, is something like hydrogen peroxide, which is toxic in um, large amounts and floating around our body. Um, okay, so when we talk about these chemicals of life, so um, more X-ray energy um, is absorbed or deposited. The more X-ray energy that's absorbed or deposited, the more damage to the chemicals of life. So we have a much higher likelihood of hitting water, but if your dose is bigger and it lasts longer, you increase the chances of coming in contact with the chemicals of life, which like I said, we're just balling them all up together. But if you want examples of them, which may show up on a quiz, like an example of a chemical life is DNA. So just like, you know, DNA, RNA, AD, um, ATP, ADP, many more. You don't need to know more than that. Just think big. 
think genetics, think DNA, RNA, DNA. So, but that's in general, that's as detailed as we're getting on this. Chemicals of life, DNA, RNA. Uh, I'm not sure I understand. Say it again. Okay. 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 Yes. Ask me if. Um, all right. So moving on. So biological effects of radiation. So the physical process leading to damage to the chemicals of life. So now we're talking about. Um, we're talking about if that radiation comes in direct contact with DNA, RNA, things like that. Um, are they're divided into two different categories? Um, we're talking. We're going to describe direct effect, and then we'll describe indirect effect. So direct effect is, you can kind of think it, think about it, it's kind of self-descriptive, like a missile coming right in and having a direct hit on its target. It's coming right in and it's hitting the um, chemicals of life. So cell damage occurs when the ionizing radiation directly hits the chemicals of life within the cell. And the results of that direct hit are death of the molecule or a molecule just doesn't function properly. And this occurs quite infrequently. So these are all your take home points. Direct effect is a direct hit to the chemicals of life. Cell either dies or severely damaged and it doesn't happen that frequently because you just don't have as much chemicals of life space. You know, It's like the football in the football field much more likely that you're going to hit somewhere on the field than the actual football so it's a lot smaller in um, indirect effect ionizing radiation deposited in the water instead of the chemicals of life so the radiolysis the whole process that we just talked about with the ionization and the free radicals forming and then them trying to find a pair and creating a toxin so this that is the indirect effect and it's going to happen much more common, much more frequently. And it can still result, though, in the same thing. It's just like a few more steps to the process. But in the end, these toxins and the whole process can still cause cellular damage. It can still cause the cell not to function as well. And it can also cause the cell to die. So you can you pretty much will get the same result either way. One is just direct and then one is happens with a few more steps. Mm -hmm. um, so is the ionizing radiation, is that just like the radiation or is it specifically saying that it's radiation that is hitting a cell? Yeah. Or like coming out of the cell? Well, if the all radiation, all X-ray radiation is ionizing radiation. However, if it passes through, it does, if it passes through and doesn't actually do anything, then it hasn't caused ionization in the cell or radiolysis. Right. But, um, but if it comes into contact and affects the electrons and whatever, you know, these different processes, then it's caused ionization in the cell or it's ionizing. But all radiation coming out of the tube head is potentially ionizing radiation. Okay, but you don't call like the other type of exciting radiation, right? Mm -mm. This, this is not mm -hmm. okay. Yes. Yes. Unless it eventually does break the bond, and then it probably could be. If it does, you know, if it just vibrates and settles down, but if it does excite it and then break the, the bonds. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I know. Okay, biological effects of radiation. It takes time for radiation damage to cause a visible change. So things do not happen. You don't, uh, I mean, I think it depends, obviously, this is this is within our scope of what we need to know. Um, but in general, you don't get an immediate reaction once you um, um, get, you know, give radiation to a certain area, you don't generally see an immediate reaction, although with dosing and um, intensity, I suppose you could. But with what we need to know about, generally speaking, it takes time for radiation damage to occur. 
So the time between radiation exposure and an observable biological change, so something that you can actually see or diagnose or have symptoms, is called the latent period. So you get the radiation and then some time goes by the latent period. And then if it did cause damage that causes some kind of an effect that you can see, then that's called the latent period. Good news, cells have the ability to repair damage from radiation and much higher likelihood that you can rebound and heal if the doses are low and they're spread out um, over a long, you know, over a period of time. So that generally when someone is going through cancer treatment and they go in for radiation treatment, they're spreading it out specifically for that reason. So there, you know, you go in however often. Low dose, more capability to repair, higher dose, less capability to repair damage. The effects of radiation is accumulative and radiation dose stays with you like a scar. So even if you um, you heal, there may be some sort of residual effect um, that you can either see with your eyes or just on a cellular level. But other cells will come in and and um, sort of pick up the work of cells that maybe have been damaged. Um, I thought I had something in my notes more about that that I wanted to say. Let me just look at this for a second. You guys always know to go in and there's always tidbits. Sometimes there's expansion of the thought. Maybe I haven't said everything I wanted to. So always go in and read the notes. Um, the radiation dose. Okay, so just some, this is probably from the textbook. The radiation dose you received 10 years ago when you had a, if you had a CT scan remains with you the rest of your life. Every subsequent exposure to radiation adds to that accumulated amount. Um, the cum uh, cumulative effect of repeated radiation exposure can lead to health problems such as cancer, cataract formation, birth defects. Um, so we do, you know, that is why you will get a patient and many of you might've seen in a practice already where you, especially an older patient that's going through radiation therapy, maybe they had like a full body scan and then you're saying, oh, you're due for your FMX. And they might just be like, oh, I just had like a ton of radiation, um, you know, and then they are, they, we, you know, can we put this off six months? Can I put it off to next year? And then you, you know, then you do your risk assessment and you say, you know, really, I, you know, let's look in their mouth and maybe they are fine. Maybe we can put it off. They just had a ton of radiation. Maybe we can put it off a year um, or maybe we can take bite wings and like this one area that we were concerned about, like one PA or, you know, you can work with patients around certain things, especially if they are really concerned about their accumulative effect or amount of radiation. Okay, determining factors for radiation injury. So we have a couple terms here, total dose, quantity of radiation received or the amount of radiation energy absorbed. So a larger dose is obviously worse than a smaller dose. Smaller dose is going to um, be less consequential and have less biological effect. Dental x-rays are considered a very small dose. And the changes, and we mentioned this later, but from when we use traditional films to digital, the I mean, the amount of radiation that we use is so much less than even just a few years ago when everything was traditional films. Um, and then if you add on something like a collimator, which really nobody does unless you're in a dental hygiene program, but if you had a rectangular collimator, um, there's just, there's, it's, I mean, it's still there. It's still, you know, the, the, there's still exposure to ionizing radiation, but the amount is very small, which is a nice thing to be able to tell your patients that in confidence, which is nice. Um, quality of x-rays also affect, um, is a determining factor for injury. Higher energy obviously is going to do more, potentially more damage, but it also gets us what we want. It gets us a good film and, and a high quality film. If you have like, kind of like weak, you know, like low quality x-ray photons and you get a really crappy film, then you can't see anything and then you have to do it again. So it makes way more sense to get a very good, clear image with higher energy, um, penetra higher penetrating um, radiation x-rays. And then as opposed to something that doesn't give you a good picture and you got to take it again or whatever. 
So you're, you're getting more bang for your buck, higher energy penetrates deeper parts of the body, lower energy absorbed by superficial layers. There's less damage to the deeper structures, but like I said, you get less qual good quality image. Um, some more factors to consider the amount of the tissue irradiated total body, total body radiation produces more adverse effects um, than smaller localized areas. Obviously we're very small um, localized area. We're just zoning into one, you know, small area, especially if you have um, like a longer BID, if you're collimated to rectangle, you are really coming in at a very focused area. If you have a short BID and it's round, there's going to be a little bit more diffusion. And so you're going to cover a little bit bigger of an area, um, but it's still overall, you know, better than, you know, scanning the whole body or half the body or whatever. Um, cell sensitivity. More damage occurs in cells that are more sensitive to radiation. So there's radio sensitive, um, there's uh, cells that are more radio sensitive and then others that are less. And we'll kind of talk a little bit more about that. But um, more damage occurs in cells that are most sensitive to radiation, radiation, such as rapidly dividing cells and young cells. So if you, if you think about any part of the body, because there's sort of two camps of cellular concern that we have as hygienists. There's the radiosensitive camp, and then there's the ones that we call like critical organs. And the reason we call them critical organs is because they're in the area that we're radiating. So they may not be radiosensitive, but we expose them a lot because that's right where, where that's in the area. So you kind of have to think about them in two sort of sections and we'll um, go over that here in a minute. But sensitivity, cells that are sensitive to radiation are gonna be very young or rapidly dividing, very sensitive um, is blood forming and reproductive cells. Um, so small lymphocytes, what is it called? Let me make sure I'm saying the right word. I think I have it in here or it might be on the next one. It might be on the next one. Um, but blood forming cells, reproductive cells, and then less sensitive are gonna be like your established cells. Like nobody here is growing much taller than they are now. Nobody's, you know, your muscles aren't changing much different. Your bones aren't changing. Um, so those cells are not rapidly dividing. You're not, they're not changing rapidly. So they are far less radiosensitive. However, don't confuse bone with bone marrow. Bone marrow is uh, the is more is rapidly dividing. This has a lot to do with your you know, blood and immune system and all of that stuff. So bone marrow is different from bone cells. So just to get those two things separated in your brain. Um. Are, is everyone? Are you okay? Is everyone all right? Any questions? Between this and dental science, do you feel like your heads are gonna explode? Yeah. <laughs> oh, you've already been through your dental science lecture. Do you have any more room left? I know that's so, it's so much to ask you guys to do both of these in one day. Like, you're like, no, we have no more room. Is that true? Like, are you giving us an option to not learn this? Because we would like to not. Oh, goodness. Yes, you do need to like run around. We'll take a break in 10 minutes. I have it on my timer, 10 minutes, give me 10 minutes. Okay, other determining factors for radiation injury are age, children are more susceptible to radiation damage, younger cells, kind of just goes along with it. Think, you know, children, younger cells, dose rate, the more damage is gonna take place with a higher dose rate because um, rapid delivery doesn't allow for cell repair. So if you're, you know, frequently dosing the person with radiation, they're gonna have more damage, kind of just makes sense. Dose rate um, is the same thing is equal to the amount of dose over the divided by time. So just how much dose you're giving them, um, depending on how much time you spread it out over more time, then their dose rate is less. If you give them a certain dose in a short amount of time frequently, then their dose rate is more. Um, 
continuing on other determining factors. Um, we talk about it in terms of acute or chronic, and this sort of a lot of these sort of seem very similar. They sort of play into the same theme. If it is acute, you're getting a lot right now. I always think of acute as you know, and whether we're talking about acute pain or acute infection or, you know, the word acute, it's like, oh, this is happening right now and it really hurts. Or chronic, it's like, oh, I always have this dull ache and it's just always there. It's like those two. So anything that's acute is like happening right now and you're getting a lot. Or if it's chronic, it's just sort of less and it just sort of is always kind of either recurrent or coming back or happening over and over. So think of the same thing with acute versus chronic exposure, acute energy given in a short period of time, you're getting a lot more severe effect, you're getting a lot in a short period of time, chronic, a small amount spread out over a long time. Dental x-rays are a perfect example of chronic. We just give a very small dose of radiation once a year, once every two years, once every whatever. Okay, I am gonna, let's do a little, let's, we'll just take a break right now because this kind of starts a new, a new thought process. So let's take, let's take a nine minute break. I, I'll use the rest of the time for the break instead of, I was gonna take a break in nine minutes, we'll just do a nine minute break. So come back at 1.45. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. What were you going to ask? Let me pause the recording. Yeah, and I also. Okay. Sorry. <clears throat> okay, let's go on. So now we're going to keep talking about the effects of uh, radiation on the tissue and the different kinds of tissue and what we have to think about in terms of, um, you know, what's important, what tissue can be damaged easier and, and so forth. So radiation biologists divide all human tissue pretty much into these two categories somatic tissues and then genetic tissues. So for our, I mean, there's, there may be more to it, but that's all we got to know is we're pretty much dividing into somatic tissue and genetic or reproductive. And that's fairly self-explanatory. If it is a genetic or a reproductive tissue, it has to do with a reproduction system in the body. Everything else is considered somatic. Um, hold on. So um, somatic radiation effects are responsible for, um, well, I don't feel like, hold on. I wanted, I thought my definitions were on the next slide. Maybe they're just in my notes here. They're on the- Is it on the nine. two slides down? No, they're on the first one. On 19, okay, they're just in the notes then. Okay, so I mean, I said it, but the notes probably say it better. So somatic effects are seen in a person who has been irradiated. No, I wanna talk about the tissue. <laughs> basically it's what i say if it's some, so like arms and legs and head and things like that and then everything else that has to do with genetics or reproductive is um the latter so i guess that is all i need to say okay so of the tissue how it is affected so if somatic tissue has been damaged from radiation if somatic tissue has been dam damaged it's only going to affect the person who's being irradiated. So if somebody has um, cancer and they're getting um, treat, you know, cancer radiation on their head and neck um, for oral cancer or something like that, they may sustain damage to salivary glands. They may sustain damage to whatever. 
Um, but if they have some kind of radiation that's going to affect their ovaries or something like that, then that is going to damage part of their reproductive system, and they can see that in their children. So they may not see any effect at all from, from the radiation damage, but they may see that effect in generations down the line. So um, radiation, so um, radiation somatic um, damage from radiation effects res is responsible for poor health, such as cancer, leukemia, cataracts. These are all things that can happen to somebody who is having radiation damage to their body at that time. So cataracts could be a side effect of it or leukemia, these kinds of things only affects the individual. Tissues are not inherited from generation to generation. You, if you get pregnant and you have a baby, that baby has their own set of somatic tissue. So it's not going to be damaged. If it's genetic, so damage to genetic tissues are responsible for um, producing the next generation. So of course, we're talking about the eggs or the sperm and the tissues are inherited from generation to generation. So that tissue that helps to create the life can be damaged. So it's considered more serious. People would, you know, they know that they're going to suffer something from having some radiation and then they know that they have a higher risk of some kind of cellular damage, you know, that's one thing. But if they know that it could affect their children or their offspring, that that's sort of a whole different category. So here's this uh, picture that sort of breaks it down very easily shows this in a visual. You have radiation to the dog. If the um, tissue is um, affecting if it's causing genetic damage, the dog is going to be fine, but their offspring um, will be affected, their health could be affected. If the radiation in, is affecting somatic tissue or a somatic mutation, the dog is going, this dog, the one that's getting the radiation will get the effect, but their offspring will not be affected. Yes. You potentially could still, but there might be a risk. Like they might tell you what, what the risk level okay. is, or it could do so much damage that maybe they would advise not to have children. So it, I guess it would depend. Sterilize. Sterilize or cause like, yeah, some kind of genetic mutation. Yeah. Oh, sorry. Oh, that, that so much radiation can make you sterile before you can have it. Um, um, so I have a doctor that would like purposely like make himself radiated before he like he would want to like stuff instead of having it. Oh. Um, and in, like, in taking an X-ray. Like, yeah, and like maybe they just have over a year. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. He's like, I'm old. Okay, I'll hold it. <laughs> he would come back. Oh, it was a female. Oh yeah. Well, oh, yeah. Not too. Yeah. 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 Sorry, I didn't. No, that's okay. Um, I always present. Um, it, I don't know that it really is, um, but I think there might, there could be that there's more literature on, um, women being like exposed to x-rays like more often because, I mean, in the dental field, more women tend to be dental assistants and hygienists and more doctors tend to be male, although that is changing quite a bit actually, but historically. So it could be that there's more literature on that. There's probably a more definitive answer. I'm just not sure. Okay. So maybe she did know something. Or Was the doctor a man or a woman? Yeah. It was a man. Yeah. So, so maybe he just didn't care. <laughs> She's like, I already have my kids. So, and you're young and vibrant. So he might've been looking out for you, but I don't know. I don't know that answer a hundred percent. Well, the for for dental x-rays so if you were to like sit in front of a beam and just irradiate yourself over and over and over and over and over again like I don't know how many times it would take but yes it would probably be very detrimental to your health and potentially could probably cause cancer but in the way that we utilize it it we don't utilize it that way at all so we don't and I have a slide in here that kind of talks about risk, so it'll kind of address that. So potentially, yeah, I mean it could, but the but the the risk is incredibly low. So and I that I will address that in a little bit. Yeah. Um, in my Holocaust, um, 
class mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. um it was one of my electives for him. Um, they would sterilize the Germans would sterilize the Jewish women. The Jewish women. Without them knowing, like they had not a table. Yeah. And they would put them on sterilization I so would sterilize them because they'd cause so much damage. That I listened to uh there's a pastor that I listened to and he was his he's from Romania. And his dad, he he lived in a time when you couldn't be Christian and you couldn't have Bibles and you couldn't pass them out. And they were constantly looking to kind of get him and catch him. And he sort of got away from it. And one day they the police took him into a room and and just he sat there for like a few hours or like the whole day or half a day. I can't remember. But then um, the next day he was incredibly, he like got sick, like incredibly fast. He got radiation poisoning. So they had like, and he went to a doctor and he said, that's what it looks like happened to you as you've been irradiated. Like just sitting, cause he didn't, he's just sitting in a room, but somehow, okay, back on task. We're getting, we're gonna get back on task. So this is so this is an image to try to give you guys a visual of what it means. So any questions on somatic and genetic? Pretty not a complicated con concept once you kind of see, see the images and stuff. Okay, so animals exposed to radiation of somatic tissue don't produce visible changes in tissue until a certain threshold dose. So now we're talking about a threshold dose and a linear progression. So there's two different, there's a uh, little schematic here that'll show this, but a threshold dose um, normally requires a large dose. So if a, a threshold dose basically means you'll get some radiation, get some radiation, and then all of a sudden, maybe after like some point in that exposure to the radiation, you start to see some effects. So it's not linear. It's not perfectly dose related. It's sort of like it takes this much before something actually starts causing significant damage enough to cause some changes in your body. So you can think of it like a sunburn, like we get radiation from the sun, but if you're out for 10 minutes, well, depending on who you are, if you're me, if you're out for 10 minutes, you get a sunburn, but other people can stay out for longer and they won't get a sunburn. So if it's, but it, there's a, it's a threshold dose. Like it depends on how long you've been out in the sun. <clears throat> Same thing for like hair loss, skin reddening, cataract formation, sterility, there you go, they're sterile. So, th so that probably does have an effect depending on how much um, radiation you're getting. So it won't happen just immediately, it just, it is a threshold. Um, so exposure of genetic tissue to radiation causes mutations uh, far that's going to be more dose like related like you get some radiation and you will if it's focused on genetic material you're going to get an, an effect like right away and it's and it's dependent on the dose so it's not like oh a little radiation is okay for my sperm count and eggs but a lot's no good but no no it's like the minute you start exposing to that you you're going to start causing some kind of a um, damage so yeah well, it, it affects, it, it goes so quickly that it interacts like microseconds. So like the interaction, so it's not like it hangs out, it will go and then it'll do, it's, it'll either interact with you or it'll bounce off and it interact with the sheetrock and the wall. So it's, it's fast. It's not like it doesn't hang out. Does this matter like where, as far as like genetic uh, mutations and like where you're supposed on your body or if like your face like it with a dental x-ray or if you had a body x-ray yeah like, yes yes so for us we don't as you know as hygienists or a dental assistants taking x-rays we don't have to think so much about genetic material other than that infrequent effect of the genetic chemicals of life in like a epithelial cell or a you know blood vessel cell or a blood cell or so but that's not the same as genetic as in like reproductive stuff so we don't because we're not x-raying that area at all so we don't have to think about it so it is different it it depends on the area the part of the body that so you're like, reading these x-rays wouldn't have any genetic mm -mm. even a yeah no yeah it totally does depend on 
where you're radiating. So if you're not a scatter radiator, it doesn't matter how much you're scatter radiating yourself, you should not have it. Well, scatter doesn't hit you anyway. It, and that's, that is why we use the, the lead apron that goes over the hole, especially like if a woman's, you know, pregnant or, you know, the thyroid collar and the lead apron. Although, Technically, you don't have to wear a lead apron anymore. You just need a thyroid collar. So they must have determined that the amount of scatter is just minuscule and just doesn't do anything to reproductive. But that is the theory of wearing the lead apron is because the scatter can bounce around and hit that area. Uh huh. Mutation have the ability to produce children with a higher likelihood of birth defects, cancers, leukemia, Mutations follow a non-threshold or a linear type dose response. And I thought I had a picture of it, yeah. So this is just a uh, picture that shows the linear, doesn't matter how much dose, the minute you start dosing, you get a uh, response. Whereas threshold, you sort of have this little lag before you get um, a reaction. Threshold curve indicates that below a certain level of, um, or a threshold, no response is seen. Linear indicates that the response is proportional to the dose. So you get a response right away. So, and then somatic, so threshold, we think of it along the lines of somatic tissue, linear curve, genetic tissue. So um, critical organs. So this, I have a bunch of notes here on the side. Um, these are, these are some, areas of the body where you can you can see an effect once when you have um, radiation to these areas. Now, it doesn't mean that they're all super radio sensitive. This is so I feel like this gets a little bit confusing because the thyroid gland um, is not one of the most most radio sensitive organs, but it is a critical organ because um, it 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 can get radiated more than other areas, especially with dental radiographs. Um, and there are a lot of people that can have thyroid cancers and things like that. So it's an area of concern. It's not as radiosensitive as say, um, you know, like bone marrow or um, reproductive, you know, cells or something like that, that turns over very quickly. Those are more radio sensitive, but we still are concerned about the thyroid gland. We're still concerned about, um, the lens of the eye because they're in that area that we're um, that we're X-raying. These are some negative things that can happen um, if if these areas are like over radiated. We're not going to do it. We're not going to be the ones to over radiate any of these areas because we're only going to take four to six bite wings and 18 films every three to five years or a piano, you know, we're not going to be the ones to over radiate, but these are the things that can happen when there's too much radiation. Lens of the eye can develop cataract, reproductive cells, genetic mutations, a fetus can have congenital defects, bone marrow, uh, leukemia, especially in children, thyroid gland, you can get thyroid cancer, skin, you can get cancer. Skin is also not a particularly high radio sensitive. There's a chart in the book that I would recommend um, just glancing at, and it shows a picture of the um, whatever item it is, if it's bone or bone marrow, it differentiates between, and then it says highly radio sensitive or low radio sensitive. So I would just look at that in the book to kind of um, be familiar with that. A um, couple things in the notes here. Um, um, the response of a cell to radiation exposure is determined by a couple things. This determines whether or not it's more radio sensitive or not. Um, the mitotic um, activity, so that's its cell turnover. Cells that divide frequently or undergo many divisions over time are more sensitive. These are, this is in the notes here. Um, cell differentiation, cells that are immature or highly, um, or not highly specialized. So they're immature and they can kind of become anything. anything. Those ones are the ones that are gonna be more radio sensitive. Cell metabolism, cells that have a high metabolism are gonna be more radio sensitive. And then there's a little more information. <clears throat> oh, this is where I was thinking about it. The cell that is the most sensitive to radi radiation are small lymphocytes. I was, had that in my head for some reason. So that's in the, the notes there. 
So critical organs exposed during dental imaging procedures in the head and neck region include the following. So these aren't necessarily the most radiosensitive, but they are ones that are all in the area that we radiate. So we just want to be aware of this. The thyroid gland, bone, oh, bone marrow. We were talking about, we need to get back to that. We were, not, we were talking about bone marrow in the face. And I don't know if it's there or not. I don't know why I should know that, but I'm going to, I'm going to investigate that. But bone marrow, it says right there, skin, um, obviously lots of skin, and then the lens of the eye. And of course, the one that we think of the most often is the thyroid gland. And we, th we think about um, salivary glands as well, but we don't, we're not going to affect a person's salivary glands with the radiation dose that they get from a dental x-ray. Um, they very likely could have an effect if they um, have head and neck radiation, if they're a cancer patient, um, it, they could have an effect on their saliva glands. Um, but per the book, saliva glands are not one of the higher radiosensitivity um, parts of the body. There's other areas that are more sensitive, but it is a, definitely an area that can get affected. If a patient's undergoing head and neck radiation, their salivary glands can definitely get um Oh, Saba, this might be answering our question right here. Hold on, in the notes, I have bone. I know, right? I I know that's what Saba and I were talking about this. And I'm like, I feel like this answer is obvious, but I'm, I don't know. I'm just having a moment where I need to look it up and learn more. The areas of the maxilla and mandible exposed during dental imaging account for a very small percentage of active bone marrow. So very small percentage of active bone marrow. The risk of cancer induction, such as leukemia. So when we're talking about the bone marrow and radiation exposure, that's pretty much what we're worried about. Leukemia is directly associated with the amount of blood producing tissue radiated and the dose. And we know the dose is very low. Leukemia is induced most likely at a dose. Um, we're going to talk about RADS and we're going to, that's the measurement of radiation. We're going to talk about that in a minute. A dose of such magnitude does not occur in dental imaging. So there's our answer, sort of, Baba. So we got some, we got some more information there about bone marrow in the face. Good. Okay. Um, radiation measurements and units. Um, so now we get into a little bit. This is another math is going to creep into here. So I, I, we're going to keep it simple because I just don't like math very much. So exposure, so the amount of radiation that comes out of an x-ray unit and reaches the person, that's what we call exposure. The, the amount that comes out of the unit and actually interacts with the person, that's their exposure. Not all is absorbed and some passes through. So they don't absorb everything that they're exposed to because some of it just passes on through. Um, the dose, absorbed dose, is the amount of radiation deposited in tissue. So that's the amount that actually gets absorbed in the tissue, reacts with the tissue, um, the amount that's actually absorbed. Dose equivalent is the sort of the third part. So we have the, um, the first two, and then dose equivalent is a concept that allows comparison of the biological effect of different types of ionizing radiation. So they will compare alpha particles, gamma rays, beta particles, and X-rays, and so, kind of see a, the, the, a dose of x-ray is equivalent to this much gamma rays or something like that, you know, so that's the dose equivalent. Equal doses of different types of radiation produce different levels of biological damage. So um, we're definitely on the lower end of all of it. Um, the tr there's two systems that you need to be aware of. So we're just going to get real specific about what you want to know here. So we're not, so you don't get, uh, you're not going to have to do any conversions or calculations, though, if you look in the book, they give you some formulas, but we're not going to do any of that. Um, but there are two systems that you need to be aware of. There's the traditional system. And you notice it says Renkin. Who was Renkin? Yes. So based on the father of dental x-rays um, or discoverer of x-rays, so there's the traditional unit of radiation measurements include the following. It includes the Renkin, which is one measurement, then RAD, which is radiation absorbed dose. And then there's REM, which is the Renkin equivalent in man. So in is silent, 
So Renkin equivalent man is REM. Um, so those are three different sort of measuring units for the traditional system. And then there's a sort of an international newer system and that's the SI units and it SI stands for something it's in the textbook and I didn't even put it in my notes I don't remember what it was but just SI units of radiation measurement includes the following um I think it's colums 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 or a slash kilograms but gray and sievert sievert gray and sievert so take home of this slide traditional is renkin rad rem SI is gray and sievert that's the take home yes what is the, the parentheses within R-N? So it stands for Renkin equivalent in man, like how much is happening in a man, in a human. Oh. Um, but it's R-E-M. It made it look like it was another abbreviation. I know. I think I just copied it from the book and that's what the pit had in the book. But so like when you say, when someone says, what does R-E-M stand for? It's that's what you would verbally say, Renkin equivalent in man, okay. instead of saying Renkin equivalent man. Um, or you just might say it's a band from the 90s. <laughs> Does anyone know that? It's like R. trivia. R. R. Did you? It was in Mexico? Oh, how funny. Nobody emailed or anything about REM anymore. Yeah, they just gonna have the classes to play. Yeah, that just play. That's so funny. Okay, very overwhelming slide. Lots of notes here. You don't have to know a ton on this slide. There is some concepts, just you know, some sort of like concepts here, but you don't have to know a ton. With with the old system, we already know that it's the Renkin, the Rad, and the Rem. And then this is telling us that because dental x-rays are such a small amount of radiation, that they're not measured in just a traditional rat, rat or rem, they're, they're milloremkin or millirad or millirem. They're like extra tiny. So they're a thousandth of a rad. They're a, a millionth of a rad, a rem, a mil, yeah, rad. So there are that one rad is a thousand millirads, um, and and then this is a millionth of a rad basically. That's this one. Oh no, it's not showing the millionth. The it's in the textbook, but you don't have to know. It's just saying that it's the milla is tiny. It's tiny, tiny. So it's smaller than your traditional one rad. So rad is a measurement of the radiation absorbed by the material in tissues and REM is a measurement of the biological effect. So we have something similar over here. It's they, they convert to be very similar ways of measuring. Um, again, I'm not gonna test you on that. There's pretty much one thing I want you to take home. So if you get this wrong, if you miss this part, if you get it wrong on an exam or quiz, I don't know what I'm gonna do with you. But of the, of the whole concept, we're going to get to it, but you can, you know, you can read through, oh, here it's in my notes. Um, anyways, it doesn't matter. You can read through some of this stuff, but I want you to be familiar with what goes in one camp and what goes in the other. Rads and REMs go in one, Sieverts and Gray go in the other. And then as we get to this one, comparing Rad and REM to Gray and Sievert, it's important to know that these kind of these two go together, but Gray and Sieverts are a hundred times bigger than Rad and REM. You can star that, you can highlight it, you can make it flash on something, I don't know, like make it interactive. Yeah. It's not just new units, it's also new, it's new, it's new conversion. It is a conversion, like it's a whole, like you would, if you knew how many rads or rem you have, there is a, there is a formula that you would follow, like a mathematical formula to find out what that equals in grays or sieverts. So there is like a whole mathematical formulation and probably radiographers need to actually learn this and probably do, they probably get, but we do not need to test ourselves on this knowledge. Um, but what you do, so, but, and to break it down in simple numbers, one sievert is a hundred rem. So sievert and rem go together. 
Um, or if you flip it around, one rem is 0 0.01 sievert. Um, and then rad and gray go together. One rad, 0 0.01 gray, or one gray is 100 rad. Um, take home point, sieverts and grays are bigger than rads and rems. And so if you, this is like, yet another way to think about it in a in a like a my brain likes this I don't know if your brain will like this but if you think you can think about it this way one dollar is is the same as a hundred pennies one sievert is the same as a hundred rem one gray is the same as a hundred rad but one dollar and one penny are not the same so one penny is much smaller than one dollar but if you have a hundred of them, it makes up a dollar. If you have a hundred rad, it makes up uh, one. Does that, is that good? Okay. It's not that, it seems like it, I mean, it is complicated, but we're not making it complicated. You don't the need, it is. Learn the words, learn Siever and gray, rad and rem, and then understand that general value and you'll be good. That's really all you need to know for assessments, for a quiz or exam. Um, okay, so some interesting information. I I just cut a huge section of this from the textbook because I just thought this whole thing was really interesting. So a lot of this in the notes is just nice to know. Um, it, I just think it's interesting. And, and if you do kind of take a few tidbits and have this, this is great information to have for your fearful patients. So if you have this, these little tidbits to share, um, it just goes a long way. But so in the United States, the average person is exposed to a total of 6.2 millisieverts of radiation per year. About half come from natural sources. So there's just no way you're going to avoid it. You're just natural sources out in the world. And then about half come from human-made sources. And then I put in the notes, um, this sort of breaks it down in a very broad way. Um, so things like the natural sources can be things like radon that it is emitted from the ground. If you live in a brick house, you could be exposed to more radiation than if you're, you live in a wooden house. Um, so there's, there's just things in the environment. If you live at certain elevations, um, you could be exposed to more natural radiation. So um, that's in the notes there, and you can read that. It's not specifically going to be tested on the stuff that's in the notes. Cosmic. So of, of our just exposure for living life, we get a large amount from things like radon um, and, um, and what is it, boron? I don't know how to pronounce that. Cosmic radiation, about 5% terrestrial um, come radiation out of the soil. Um, and then internal is another 5%. So, and then for synthetic or man-made, we have medical procedures, nuclear medicine, and then consumer products. So just depending on what people do, what foods they eat, it just varies. It's just going to vary. So things like if you tend to eat a lot of bananas and Brazil nuts, it's you're going to have more radiation per the book. Those are some examples. Um, certain foods and certain foods and waters. Does somebody love Brazil nuts over here? You're getting radiated. <laughs> you like bananas or watch out how much bananas you eat. I like bananas. Um, but I just think it's really interesting because there's just, there's just a few things. I'm seeing if there's something else in here. I would just like the airplane. Yes. I mean, that is a, that's a great one. Like when you tell your patients how much they get from getting on an airplane, I mean, they just don't think about things like that. They don't think about, because they're happily getting aboard an airplane to go to Mexico or to go to Hawaii, but so they don't think about that. Okay. Um, so in addition to the naturally occurring background radiation, there's, of course, there's also the book talks about modern technology. Um, we have a lot of man-made sources um, and things like luminous wristwatches, television, computer screens. Then there's things that sound more scary, like atomic weapons, um, nuclear fuels, um, 
fuel cycle and all the sources of humans. So there's many, many, many sources that of radiation that people very willingly expose themselves to. Yes. Measuring, uh, yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's measuring the absorbed. I think it's the REM. The book says it. I don't even know. I might have it in the things. I think it's REM and is it Siebert? I think it's REM and Siebert that measure absorbed dose. Yeah. REM sleep. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, okay. So, uh, okay. So that's, so there's just extra information and that just kind of in a, in a ballpark, it gives everybody, a, they get a lot of exposure. Bottom line. All of that information on slide 33, all of that information, I will tell it's just, I just think it rounds out your knowledge so that you're able to communicate. Like, um, um, oh my gosh, Lacey. <laughs> Who's that person over there? That person. Lacey said, you know, when you find something you like to talk to patients about, like you can compare it to riding on an airplane or something like that. When you find, when you have a few tidbits that stuck in your brain, it gives you some information to share with a patient and you can put them at ease. So whatever it is, so like read through it because I think it's good to know, but I won't test you on it. Okay. Um, in other words, the risk of dental imaging are not significantly greater than the risk of other everyday activities. A few more just interesting little factoids. The potential risk of dental imaging induces, so here's the risk that someone was asking. You were asking Naboo about, can, can you get cancer? So the risk of inducing Fatal cancer in an individual has been estimated to be approximately three in one million. But in comparison, which you might go, oh my gosh, you mean there's even a risk that we could induce fatal um, cancer? But in comparison, other modern day activities have an even higher chance, one in one million, of if you ride your bike for 10 miles, if you drive in a car for 300 miles, if you ride in a plane for a thousand miles, if you smoke cigarettes, um, one and a half cigarettes per day, roughly. So all of those things have a higher risk than taking a dental x-ray and people gladly do all of it. And so it gives them some perspective. Does it, um, yeah, I don't know if it's a lifetime. I don't know, maybe the book. Yeah, I'm not sure if it's lifetime or if it's just a current, I'm not sure. Yeah. How do you think it would like separate that How would they take it? All the Yeah. I I have no idea. Statisticians, they're a weird bunch and it, it it might not even be like who knows? Maybe it's not even true. No, but they do, you know, they come up, they do modeling and they do statistics and then they think like, well, this is pretty much what it it seems to be. I don't know how they come up with it, but it's supposed to be taken at face value, but question everything, Lacey. Question. I think it's death. It's That's a brilliant observation. <laughs> how did you get cancer from riding a bike? But I think that, I think it's that, yeah, a cancerous car hit you. But I think it I think it has more to do with the fatality. I think it has more to do with the fatality. Oh, I was like it is, isn't it? That's like what Lacey was saying. She's like, how do they even figure this out? I don't know. Somebody yeah. There was a there was a guinea pig. Somebody they they must you know statisticians or you know people who are into statistics and there must be some sort of option. there's something that they can do figure it conversion. out conversion yeah there's something there's there's whole industries of like risk assessments like is there was a there was a movie about that too where was it Ben Stiller was like figured out the risk of everything and he like like the chances of me dying in a you know like if I jump out of this airplane do you remember that. I love it, I love it. Yeah, I can't remember what that movie was. What was it? Jennifer Aniston was in it too. Yeah, yeah. 
can't remember. It was funny. Ben Stiller and Jennifer Aniston. And like she had a ferret. And she wanted to date. Oh, they went and had like some kind of ethnic food that gave him a tummy oh, upset because he couldn't, he couldn't handle it. The whole movie's funny. I recommend it. I can't remember what it's called. Someone will remember it. Along, along came Polly. That was funny. That was funny. Okay, we're we're almost there. We're almost there. So assessing the risk from dental x-rays. Here is just a here is just a little um, chart that sort of talks about um, these are all in micro sieverts, so these are just very small, um, and it just compares like one bite wing as opposed to um, a large field of view CBCT scan. It's a very large X ray, but they can also hone it in to a they can make the field of view smaller, um, but or a complete series with a round collimator. You can see you can just compare the different um, amounts of radiation. It depends if it's round or rectangular. Um, mm -hmm, there is a big difference from round to rectangular for sure. Um, so the now we talk a little bit about protection. The bottom line is with all of this information that's now swirling around in your head, the bottom line is that you want to follow the principle of Alara, Alara, which is as low as reasonably achievable, which just means you just want to take the best set the, out the gate the first time you do it so that you don't have to do retakes. That is why really that we use the rectangle collimator because we know that there will be more retakes while you're in school. It's just a given. And so it's giving you the opportunity to take a few more films without feeling, you know, badly, I guess, although I don't know if anyone would feel bad, but you know what I mean? Like to be able to take pictures um, and retake a picture and not feel like you've given them excess radiation. It happens in private practice. People still have to, you know, the doctor's like, oh, no, you got to take that again. And it happens. So it just gives us more leeway. Um, Patient protection, only take x-rays that are needed based on patient's history, clinical examination, take them well the first time, retakes, double the radiation of dose, of course. So if you have to take another film, it gets that much more um, exposure. Um, some more patient protection, film speed. Uh, this is important to know. You can highlight this. F speed requires less than half the exposure of D speed. So if you get a question that says, of all the following films, what would be the most ideal film speed to reduce patient radiation? The answer would be F. So if, if you've got A speed, B speed, C, you know, but you want to pick F. F is the right answer. F for fast. Digital um, is lower than any traditional. So digital does not go under the A, B, C, D, F, whatever. Digital is digital. So those numbers those speeds of film are only uh, equivalent to traditional film. They're only um, for a traditional. Digital is lower than any of those. Kilovoltage, uh, all machines should be at a min minimum of 60 kVp. Most modern x-ray machines operate closer to 70, 65 to 70. Um, filtration of the beam is required by law. We either will have a 1.5 millimeter or 2.5 millimeter, depending on the kVp of your um, at your x-ray unit. Um, the collimation of the beam, bless you, maximum seven um, centimeters diameter with a round cone. And then a long cone is preferred over a short cone because you get less diffusion, so less spread of your beam. Um, so uh, the collimation, you can see if you have a round beam, um, how much more uh, radiation they'll get on their face. Whereas if you have a rectangle, it really dials it down to just a small area. Um, and it reduces the patient's radiation by 50% using a rectangular one, reduces the area of exposure, um, and it's preferred. Um, patient protection, we use the XCPs. This also gives us a better picture, like, you know, the first time around. And so it because of that, it's going to um, cause less radiation because you're not going to have to take the picture again if you get a good shot. Um, so that's why we learned to use the XCPs. Minimizes errors and retakes. Uh, lead apron, of course, we know this is kind of a weird topic because technically, legally, they, they all they have to wear is a thyroid collar, but we still use the... the anybody practicing dental assisting that didn't use a lead apron at all, you... at at the perio office you know, yeah did they just take a period of time where they had to educate their patients and patients just a, didn't care like a lead curtain. 
around so oh i see what you're saying kind of scatter, yeah like, yeah more that's interesting but yeah it went like around yeah because like, our cbct scan was just right in the middle of the operatory with nothing anywhere so that's interesting so they had like a little curtain yeah it was like, all the way, it was like in the corner of like yeah hallway. interesting but for bite wings and pas no lead apron anybody else no lead apron yeah so they just left and patients that oh you guys yeah go ahead yeah yeah they'd be like my god yeah, I know. It's nice to give them the option, I think, probably. It makes sense. Yeah, but they used it for PAs and bite wings. Yeah. You always had it. Yeah. We just, I always just put them on. But that's just a habit. What's that? Yeah. Oh, no, no. Yeah. Oh, I feel like there's no right or wrong. I think it's nice to give patients, but I mean, if the radiation safety world has said it's deemed it not, I think it's probably a more modern advancement to be like, well, we're not really but it's also probably, I think a lot of, especially older patients might be like, what are you doing? So I can kind of see it going both ways. Yeah, the Nomad too, yeah. Um, interesting. So basically we still do it just because we figure the time it would take to explain it to every patient. We get so many new patients. So we just, we just do it. Um, we've talked about it a few times in faculty meetings, but, um, it just seems like it's one less thing to explain to patients. So there's that. But if you go into your own office after graduation, you will encounter whatever their culture is and whatever their, the doctor likes to do or whatever. Um, lead aprons recommended even though dose um, to the abdomen is very low. Thyroid collar is most important part. Um, and typically most places would always have a thyroid collar. This is just talking about if you're gonna process traditional films to do them accurately in a dark room. Oh shoot, I gotta hurry because I still wanna go over those things. Um, radiation protection, source of x-ray exposure. So the source for you, primary radiation scatter off the patient's face. Uh, um, anything that lowers the dose to the patient is gonna lower the dose to you. So if you're using a collimate, rectangular collimator or the filtration, it'll lower it. Operation, uh, the operator should never be in the direct beam. You should never hold uh, um, something in the patient's mouth. Um, you know, I know that everybody here who's assisted has probably done it before. Um, I've seen it done over and over and over again. And if you if you're in an office where that's sort of okayed by the doctor, you just tell you know like your doctor or your coworker be like, okay, will you hold it and I'll go push the button. <laughs> just kidding. I'm just totally kidding. Don't you you don't want to encourage anybody else to do it, and you don't want to be the one to hold it. So really, everything you can do to have the patient hold it in their own mouth, have the patient hold it. They have two arms. Have the patient hold it. it yeah, unless they're little. It can be hard. Um, Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 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 I just, I just think that you should tell the doctor that that's not. Um, I'm not comfortable with that. And if you want to do it, you hold it. I'll go push the button. I mean, if they really like, and I don't recommend. I honestly. I, I don't think that they should either, but if that's where they're going to, like, this has to happen, they can be exposed. Well, they don't have to, to, you don't have to get exposed over and over again. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. You never have to worry about assisting root canals ever again, unless you really desperately want to, I suppose. Radiation protection for the operator. You want to stand six feet away from the primary beam. 
as long as you're staying at a 90, like if you're in the room and you're 90, like the beam's coming out and you're perpendicular to the beam or you're 90 degrees to the beam, technically you should be in a safe zone. If you're behind a wall, you are safe. It, the x-rays are not going to go through like sheet rock, especially if there's a light apron, like um, at um, Lacey's office, if there's something like that, you're totally fine. Um, they're not going to snake their way out of the room and get you. So it's so it's fine. <laughs> um, never hold films in the patient's mouth. Never hold or stabilize tube head during exposure. So we said that. This is just showing the perpendicular. If you're perpendicular to the beam, um, you should kind of be in a safe zone. Um, these are just some numbers, maximum permissible dose limits. It's a uh, very little chance of somatic or genetic injury if you stay below these doses. For a radiation worker, it's 50 millisieverts a year for the whole body. If it's a dental, um, pregnant dental personnel, um, the radiation exposure limit is far less. Um, and then if it's a general public, it's far less than a radiation worker. Um, and then pregnant operator um, falls under these guidelines as well. Wait a minute, this is different, huh? I, one came from the updated textbook and one came from last year's. I didn't take this one out. So this one might, I might, you might just delete this. But basically it's, a, it's an amount that you wouldn't easily reach. And if you were ever curious about what your um, amount is, have your doctor get a dosimeter and wear the dosimeter and just find out if you're getting anywhere close to um, that um, that rate. And I guarantee you, unless there's a malfunction in your office, you're not getting. Um, when I was pregnant, I wore a dosimeter because I wanted to make sure and um, it never registered. So has anyone else worn a dosimeter? You order it like Henry Schein or Patterson um, or other companies. And then you like once a month, you send it in. They send you a new one and you send in the old one and then they send a report. It's pretty easy and it's not that expensive. So if, is that, well, when I did it, it was less than a hundred for the year, but it's probably more now, but it's, it wasn't very expensive and the doctor should pay for it or the, or if you were for Kaiser or Willamette, they should pay for it. Um, the, some people just keep them in, in the radiation area like they'll keep a dust meter they won't wear it they'll just keep it in the area where the scatter would be and which just seems kind of a little bit silly but they i've heard people say well we've kept kept it in the room and with the scatter it still doesn't register above um you know the, the minimum rate that you would want so but it's it's not a bad idea to do that especially if you have any concerns so these are just summarizing receptor choice collimator technique it's just repeat from earlier so you can just read through that and i'm going to close this down because i want to very briefly we only have a few more minutes and i want to show you guys i'm going to stop share and then i'll pull up um the guidelines from on the moodle page I wonder if I, um, I don't know. I'm gonna share it, but I don't know that it will, cause I'm gonna click onto a couple different areas and I don't know that it will follow me, you know, as I share. So you, I mean, you'll still hear my commentary on it, but I don't know that it will follow what I'm doing. So this is, this is the one uh, photo, photograph, or photograph, radiograph prescribing gu guidelines from ADA. And this, you can use this, these three pages, um, to go through and look and see what kind of general, you know, you're obviously, everybody's going to be a little bit different when we talk about their assessments, when you determine their perio risk, their caries risk, are they a new patient? Are they a recall patient? Are they older? Are they younger? All sorts of things. Um, but that, but this is set up so that you can see this in a table form. So new patient being evaluated for oral disease. And then you go along the top here and you have a child with the primary dentition, a child with a transitional dentition, so they have some baby teeth and some adult teeth, an adolescent with all permanent teeth, an adult who is denate or partially edentulous, meaning they are missing some teeth, 
and then an adult who's a dentalist, so they don't have any teeth. And yes, you still take x-rays on somebody who doesn't have teeth because you want to evaluate um, their their jaw, their joint, you know, changes in just the whole that whole area. You can even see um, calcification of the carotid, um, the carotid what vein, artery, artery. Oh my, I need to go back to anatomy and physiology, but you can see you can see calcium buildup in the carotid um, artery um, if somebody has that going on, if an older person has that going on. So there are lots of reasons to still take an x-ray if someone doesn't have any teeth, which is can be surprising. Um, but then you would look down here. So we're dealing with a new patient with these, it, these categories of people who are new, drop down um, these categories of people who are in a recall. Um, with clinical caries or increased caries risk. So then we can see what, there's some recommendations. Posterior bite wings, six to 12 months intervals if proximal surfaces cannot be examined visually. And then this, uh, for adults, we're looking at six to 18 months and what have you. So go through this chart and then just look and see the various um the various recommendations for time. There's some other information down here too on the last page talks about positive um, historical findings. So these are things that that if somebody has um, falls under these different um, situations where they have a history of pain or trauma, it might influence it. And then down here, positive clinical findings. So deep carious lesions, so big cavities, if there's some kind of an abnormal growth. So there's all these different reasons why you might need to take an x-ray outside of your just typical, well, we only take it every six months or every 12 months or whatever it is. So this is one guideline. And then this group, I don't know who did this, but some group took that information and they created this, um, this tool. And this is not the format that I wanted you guys to actually see there. And I couldn't find it. I'll look for it. And if I can find it next week, or if I find it, I'll post it on Moodle. But this is a PowerPoint. This this is in the PDF format, but it's um, the way I was wanting you guys to look at it was in a in a in a PowerPoint format because you get one slide at a time, and it's really cool because you can click through it. So go to main menu, and now we have um, children with primary dentition, child with transitional, the same thing. These are the categories on the table. And so let's say you have a kid in your chair. Well, you don't see very many kids. So let's say you have an adult, um, with their permanent dentition. So we'll select that. So, oh, that's adolescent. Okay. Let me go back. Hold on. Where's my adult one? Adult with, um, permanent or partially edentulous. So you have an adult in your chair. Are they a new patient? Are they a recall? And then there's assessment of skills, skeletal relationships. So there's this other button. So let's say they're a recall patient. Do they have patient with clinical caries or increased caries risk? Patient with no clinical caries and low caries risk or a patient with periodontal disease? You know, where what's their best fit? So, okay, well, my patient has periodontal disease. Um, use clinical judgment regarding the need for and the type of images. So this is where it's it's not going to spell it out for you, but you may need vertical bite wings with this patient, right? So imaging may consist, but is not limited to selected bite wings and or PA images um, of the area where periodontal disease or other nonspecific gingivitis is demonstrated clinically. And I think it would be, would have been nice to say to to, to remind the clinician that vertical bite wings might be necessary here, but they didn't. But it's just kind of a cool tool. If it's in the um, PowerPoint, you can, it doesn't show all the slides on the side. I don't know how to, anyways, it's cool. I like it, yeah. So we, in our clinic, we tend, because our population tends to be, uh, a higher risk. We have a lot of perio and a fair amount of caries. We do tend to do like a three year, um, but it's basically, we still fall between the three to five years for uh, FMX. And it just strictly depends on the patient, you know, what the doctor, it's just like in clinical practice. If you're, if Dr. Saunders is like, this patient is very high risk for caries and perio. Yes, we took an FMX three years ago, but all of our fees are much cheaper. Um, I would, you know, I'd like to either get a bite wing and these PAs, or I'd like to get another FMX. So we still 
talk about it with our faculty and talk about it with the doctors. Um, so we fall between that three to five window, three to five year window. So look through this, look through these recommendations. So you get start to get a feel for, especially those of you who haven't worked in a dental office, how often are bite wings typically recommended? You know, so what's the window and how often are FMXs typically recommended? What's the window and what can affect the, the um, frequency? And then this, I took off, I, I think I took off all the answers. I had this uploaded with all my answers in the notes and I think I went through and deleted it. But if you go down here in the Moodle, so make a note of this somewhere so you don't forget, but see it says case study, um, case study assignment complete and bring it back to class. So these, all you have to do, you don't have to print this whole thing out because it's a lot of, um, it's, so just on a piece of paper, just say case one through five and then just answer the, um, the situations utilizing those tools, the guidelines that I just showed you. So like case one, your 16 year old male patient has not been, um, by, has not been seen, has not been by a dentist, that's weird, um, by a dentist in 10 years uh, when he was treated for several cavities. So it's been a very long time. The last time he went, he had a lot of cavities in his primary teeth, but now he's 16. So he doesn't have primary teeth anymore. He's got adult teeth. His school lunches consist of Lunchables, Coke, Fruit Cup, Oreo cookies. Does that sound like super duper healthy or maybe a little bit too much fermentable carbohydrates? He is um, an athlete and drinks a lot of sports drinks. He complains that his teeth are sensitive to cold. So I know you guys haven't hit, there's so much information here that you haven't even touched in classes. There's, you know, but if you were to take an, uh, just sort of a broad guess about this person, take that information and look at the guidelines and see what might be recommended. And work, you can work together, find somebody who's been in office and and work together with them and just just answer those one through five cases and bring that and we'll talk about it a little bit at the beginning of class we um we'll just keep it we'll, we'll go over it at the beginning of class so it's not it's not graded it's just for your knowledge because you need it you need this knowledge it's good stuff um and that's it you guys have any questions at all Yes. Um, this this content, like the, the prescribing, the radiograph, that's not going to be on the quiz. So the only thing on the quiz is from the PowerPoint that we just went over. Yeah. So there'll be 15 multiple choice questions um, on chapters. It says chapters three and four, but really it's this PowerPoint that I just went over. I mean, that content is in three and chapters three. Um, yeah, so those cases, just bring them, have it completed and bring them with you. And after the quiz, we'll talk about those a little bit. Just to clarify, especially for people who haven't worked in an office before, we can kind of go through those cases and clear them up. All right, enjoy Spanish. I'll be in here with you guys too, whoever's taken Spanish this afternoon. I'm not. I don't have to, I haven't, I enjoy it so much, but I haven't even studied. I feel so bad. I'm like such a bad student. I enjoy listening and I'm like, this week I'm going to practice. And I practiced a little bit with my husband. He speaks, he understands more than he speaks, but um, I did a little bit more this week, but still I, I need to do more. I'm so bad. I'm such a bad student. I'm just auditing it. So I don't need to take them. It's not fair, is it? It's not fair.